Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Lord of the Harvest Christian Fellowship. I'm Pastor Jan. I'm going to open with um, a short scripture out of uh, Isaiah 59. Philip read it this morning. It's quite long, um, but God is good, and he promises a lot of things in here. Um, I just want to read a couple, though. Isaiah 59, verse 1, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened, that it cannot save, nor is his ear heavy, that it cannot hear. And then if you go to uh, verse 20, The Redeemer will come to Zion, and to those who turn from transgression in Jacob, says the Lord. As for me, says the Lord, this is my covenant with them. My spirit who is upon you and my words which I have put in your mouth shall not depart from your mouth, nor from the mouth of your descendants, nor from, um, I'm sorry, nor from the mouth of your descendants, descendants, says the Lord, from this time and forevermore. Dear God, I just pray for an awakening in all our hearts, dear God, to know that you are always truly for us, not against us. And even though each one of us are in different places, struggling with different things, Lord, May we always know that you are for us, Lord, that you are willing to do whatever it takes to help us in our hour of need, Lord. I pray this day that, dear Jesus, we all learn to look to you, dear God, that we all desire in our heart of hearts to follow you and not let things interfere, Lord, with our journey with you. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Well, today I'm going to read out of Mark 5. So if you want to turn your Bibles there. You know, it's been on my heart a long time, and I'm sure it's been on your heart too. Uh, I want more of Jesus, and I want to plug into more of Jesus. I want to push into more of Jesus. And that means that I have to change a lot of things in my life. If Jesus is going to be the center, think about that. He's in the center I have to push some things out of that center that I uphold as wonderful and great and awesome. I'm putting him there. So it's going to change my whole landscape of my life. Things that I treasured before, things that I wanted to do, things, places I wanted to go, I pushed to the out to put Jesus in the center. Now, it's very possible Jesus will take some of those things that I, I like and bring them along. But it's also possible he will tell me to shut those doors. So I have to be willing. Now we're going to read about um, a story about two, two, well, one's almost a woman and one is a woman. Uh, One is Jairus' daughter and the other one is a nameless woman, the woman with the issue of blood. How would you like to go down in history with that title? All right. But what happened was Jesus was in the boat um, and he came to shore and he was met by a... um, a demon-infested man. Make a long story certain. Jesus cast out the demons into some pigs that ran into the water and were killed. And so that's how this chapter starts. And then as Jesus is on his journey, um, let me find where I want us to start. Um, Let's go to... 21. Now, when Jesus had crossed over again by boat to the other side, a great multitude gathered to him. He went by the sea. And behold, one of the rulers of the synagogue came, Jairus by name. And when he saw him, he fell at his feet. Now, think about that. And begged him earnestly, saying, My little daughter lies at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her, that she may be healed and she may live. And so Jesus went with him, and a great multitude followed him and thronged him. Now, first of all, Jairus is a, uh, probably, he's a leader in the synagogue. We know that uh, the leaders of the Jewish people did not like Jesus. They didn't believe in Jesus. And here was Jairus, really, at the end of his rope, his 12-year-old daughter is dying. He has tried everything, I am sure. And he is willing to be humbled and go to Jesus and ask for his help, even though he knows his peers will probably uh, ridicule him. And probably, what is wrong with him? You're giving the people what they want. You're justifying Jesus. Are you crazy? Now, I want to say something else here. She's 12. And when we read about the next person, she had the issue of blood for 12 years. 
12 is symbolic. It, it means wholeness. And so we're going to see in both these people, God is going to do a work. He's going to make them whole again. But Jesus does it on his timing. He does it. He does it not because we ask or when we ask. He does it on his timing. So that's good for you to know. It doesn't look like my prayers are being answered. Well, don't think that way. Don't think that way. Hope delayed is not hope deferred, right? It means it's still coming. That answer is still coming. And we always have to remember, is Jesus is the captain of the ship. And we're not making the call. We're not saying how that's going to look. Jesus is. Okay, so this is called a sandwich uh, story. Uh, we're starting with uh, Jairus, and then we're interrupted by the woman uh, with the issue of blood. And then we go back to Jairus. So it's kind of, we have, we have like a big story going on, and we have this little story that interrupts the big story. Now, a certain woman had a flow of blood for 12 years. We see the number 12 again. And it had suffered many things from physicians, and she spent all that she had and no better, and was no better, and she grew worse. She spent all her money, literally. She went to doctors that were not like our doctors now. And, you know, who knows? Maybe they made it worse. Maybe it was a painful experience for her and so humiliating. Now, this, this issue of blood for 12 years, according to Le Leviticus, she could not touch anyone. She could not, if she touched anything, it was unclean. She was unclean. And so... She, I don't know. Maybe she lived alone. Maybe she had a husband. I don't know. But she, if she wasn't married, she cannot get married. She's unclean every day. So when I think about her, I think about what was going on physically with her. Well, she's suffering. How about spiritually? She's suffering. How about emotionally? She's suffering. How about um, financially? She's suffering. How about relationally? She's suffering. She is an outcast. No, no one will go near her that we know of because she's unclean. And you think about that stigmatism. You think about what does that do to a person to think I'm unclean? I, no one will talk to me. No one will come near me. I'm unclean. So she feels so abandoned by her community. Abandoned. Maybe she's even thinking she's abandoned by her God. I don't know. But she's totally down and out. She's used all her money, spent her 12 years of her life seeking an answer. And she heard a little rumor. She heard a little story about a healer coming to town. And again, just like Jairus, it's her last, last attempt. So here she goes. And when she heard about Jesus, she came behind him in the crowd and touched his garment. Now, usually the, when they talk about the crowds around Jesus, they're usually men. The women had to stand back. So you have all these men thronging Jesus, just totally surrounding him. And, you know, back then, if he's going down a little street, it's a little street. It's like probably half of half of our streets. And houses there were close together. And it was it was just, you, you feel like you couldn't even get a breath of fresh air from all the people. And she pushed in, even though she knows she's a woman, She's unclean, and there's all these men. And I think that's very interesting, that even in her feeling of abandonment, of a lo loneliness, and um, being rejected by everybody, she's willing to give it one last shot. And what I think is so interesting about this is she's exposing herself. What if one person in that crowd goes, look, it's so-and-so, she's unclean, and they all scream and push her away and trample her. She's willing to take the risk. She's willing to touch Jesus, which, again, is amazing because she's unclean. She's going to touch the man that's the healer. So, again, we're seeing a lot of interesting things going on in both these stories. Jairus is going to someone where his community of leaders are very prejudiced against Jesus. We're looking at the woman with the issue of blood coming from a community that would say, no, you cannot touch Jesus. You're unclean. So he has some similarities going on there. Jairus went to Jesus regardless. He didn't care. And, and this woman is pushing forward regardless of what, what could happen. So she's pushing through and she gets through. And let's keep going here. Of course, I lost my place. Um, 
And for she said, if only I may touch his clothes, I shall be made well. So you can press into Jesus. You can press into curiosity can cause you to press into him. But faith will lead you to touch him. I'm going to say it again. Curiosity can get you to press into him. You might come to church because you're curious. And that's not enough. Faith makes you touch him. Faith makes you want him. Curiosity is never going to be um, important enough to keep you going. Okay, so she says in her mind, if only I may touch his clothes, I shall be made well. Couldn't even touch her clothes. Immediately the fountain of her blood was dried up and she felt in her body that she was healed of the affliction. Immediately she felt it. She felt it. That that to me is so incredible that immediately she knew that God had he had um he had healed her. And he said Jesus and Jesus immediately knowing in himself that power had gone out of him, turned around in the crowd and said who touched my clothes? And of course, his disciples are like, do you see this multitude thronging you? And you say, who touched me? See, Jesus knew the difference of a touch. He knows when we're crying out to him. And we're serious. And we want to be closer to him. And he knows when we're just doing our duty. It's not deep. It's not, it's not for any purpose, but just for that moment to check that off our list. You see, when when God gives us things to pray for, for instance, I'm going to use that as an example. And he gives you a person to pray for. God wants you to pray for that person for whatever reason. You can include the church, but you can't expect to dump it at the church's feet and then walk away. God is calling each one of us to do something in this hour. You can't pass it on. You have to partake of that, that that journey God wants you to be a part of. So when she touched him, it just wasn't like like all those men that are thronging around him, probably touching him everywhere. She, It was a deep touch. It was something that power went out of him. He felt it. It was released. She was immediately changed. That's the kind of touch we want to have to God. We want to make that connection. And he looked around to see who had done this thing. And you know Jesus knows. And the woman, fearing and trembling, knowing what would happen to her, came and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. See, she knew if she said, Jesus, I've had the issue of blood blood for 12 years. I'm unclean. She's fearful now. What will he say? How dare you come and touch me? Now I'm unclean and I have to go now and I have to be in quarantine for a day because you touched me. I have to be in quarantine. That sounds so familiar to us. She ruined it for him. So she's afraid and then she's afraid. Now she's just exposed herself in front of all these people that obviously didn't know her, know her story. And now they're going to be upset now we all have to quarantine and now we're missing out on jesus thank you very much look what jesus said daughter your faith has made you well daughter he called her daughter that's such an affectionate term it's such a term of endearment he didn't say hey you okay yeah go on thanks for nothing now i gotta go no he called her daughter Wouldn't you love it for Jesus just to, when you pray, you hear him call you daughter or son? Don't, wouldn't we just love that? And so how do we get that? How do we get Jesus to call us daughter, son, loved one? You gotta, you gotta touch him. You gotta reach out and take the risk when it looks like you're making a fool of yourself. Jairus looked like he was making a fool of himself. This woman looked like she was making a fool of herself. I can think of other examples in the board. Zacchaeus, up on the tree, fool, fool, come on down. Are we willing to do that? Are we willing to make a fool of ourselves to touch Jesus? Your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your affliction. 
Can you imagine? Can you imagine how joyful she was? Her whole life has just opened up. And while he was still speaking, someone came from the ruler of the synagogue's house who said, Your daughter's dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? Now, you can only imagine what Jairus was thinking. Thanks, lady. Thanks for nothing. Because if he would have kept walking, hopefully he would have got to my daughter in time. But you interrupted his walk. You interrupted this time schedule. Thanks a lot. And as soon as Jesus heard the word that was spoken, he said to the ruler of the synagogue, Do not be afraid. Only believe. Now, Jairus is being tested. What will he do? Will he just say, Jesus, forget it? Or will he say, Okay, I'm going to believe. Come with me. Now, the dead is unclean. For seven days, if you touch a dead person, you're unclean for seven days, not one. Like Jesus touched, this woman touched him, he'd be unclean for one day. Seven days, according to the law. So, Jairus knows the law. Should I have this rabbi come and touch her and then be unclean for some? What am I going to do? And he permitted no one to follow him except Peter, James, John, the brother of John, John, uh, uh, James. And then he came to the house of the ruler of the synagogue and he saw a toma, a toma and those who wept and wailed loudly. Now they had to call for the mourners right away because bodies disintegrated. They rotted very quickly in Palestine. So he had to get the mourners there. So the mourners were probably on standby. There they are. They're mourning. They're, they're playing their flutes. They're wailing. And when he came in, he said to them, Why make this commotion and weep? The child is not dead, but sleeping. And they ridiculed him. They ridiculed him. But when he had put them all outside, he took the father and the mother of the child and those who were with him and entered where the child was lying. See, when God works, he can work anywhere. But he doesn't want ridiculers in there. He doesn't want people laughing and making fun. They don't have an interest and they don't have a belief in what he's going to do. See, we have to go that depth and believe and and touch him for the power for him to come out. We have to go deep with him. So he's escorting them out. They obviously didn't believe. So why should they be a part of the glory that was going to happen? And then he took the child by the hand and said to her, Talitha Kumi, which is translated little girl, I say to you, rise, daughter, arise. Daughter, arise. Another affectionate term by Jesus. Immediately the girl arose and walked, for she was twelve years of age, and they were overcome with great amazement. And he commanded them strictly that no one should know it, and said that something should be given her to eat. So I want to say that, um, you know, the girl had lived for twelve years. She had life, sunshine, light. She had it all. And obviously her parents were well-to-do. The one with the issue of blood had not life, did not have sunshine, was in darkness. But then Jesus touched both of them and restored, restored them. And my hope is that the little girl <laughs> became a follower of Jesus. The woman of the issue of blood, I'm sure, became a follower of Jesus because her whole life was radically changed. So the question for us is, how do we go to that next level? How do we, how, and I guess here's my bigger question to you. What is your issue? What is your issue? Is it a physical issue? Is it a spiritual issue? Is it financial? Is it emotional? Is it, um, what's the other one, relational? What's your issue? Are you willing to take it to the Lord and, no matter what, make a fool of yourself? Make a fool of yourself? What does that even mean? Well, what if I'm having a relational uh, issue with a relative? It might mean I have to say I'm sorry to be set free. It might mean I have to call him up and give him a hug or tell him I love him. We have issues in our lives that God wants to us to touch him and be set free. He wants us to manifest for his glory. 
But I really believe in this hour. God is drawing us to his feet. He's drawing us to the place where we can say, I believe. I absolutely 100% believe that you, you are the Savior. You are the Creator. You are all I need. You are the center of my life. And our life is going to change. It's going to look radically different. Radically different. If we want revival, it's going to be painful. I'm just going to say that. It's going to be painful because why? I can't pray for revival and continue how I'm living. I have to purify my life. I have to get things right. So if we really want revival, want God to move, we've got to change. And it might mean praying every day. It might mean attending the Bible study on Wednesday night, joining the prayer group on Thursday. It might mean other things for you. It might mean turning the TV off and getting on your knees. It might mean, I don't know, you know what you do. You know what you can cut out. You know what isn't godly. And not that it's ungodly. It's just not God. It it doesn't have him in it. So anyway, um, that's where my heart's been, pushing into Jesus so that I, I do the things he, he, he would be doing in this hour. And I would think like him and have a heart like him. And it's hard. It's hard. It's really hard. So don't think it's an easy walk. All right, Jesus. Jesus, Jesus, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. It's time for communion, Lord. We thank you, Lord. That you died for us, Lord. I say this every week, but it's so true. You are an amazing, amazing God. I don't know of any other God (laughs) that people profess that would die this horrible death you did and set us free. So thank you, God, for your body. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. And Lord, we thank you for the blood. We thank you, willing to pour it out for us, Lord, that we may live, live in you, dear Jesus. I pray. For all the women with the issue of blood, I pray for all the people that are facing death. I pray for them. I pray for all the men. I pray for all the children, Lord. I pray, dear God, that you move upon our lives, that you move upon our minds, dear God, and spark us, Lord. Respark us. Regenerate us, Lord, so that we want nothing but you. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I'm going to pray for all of you. That really something is sparked in you. That it's just not, I go to church, I do this. I do, that you are hungry and thirsty for God. And that you read the word. You join us on Wednesday. You join us on Thursday. That you are looking every day for something. Yesterday, I could not get enough. I just kept reading the story. Kept reading the story over and over. And you know what? If you take a story, any story, and you keep reading it, read it all week. Commit to that all week. You will be amazed what you will see, what God will show you. So thank you. Um, And we have Sunday school now. Please have your children join. It's really good. It's really rich. And we want our kids to, our descendants, to be part of this too. Thank you. Amen. Good morning. Well, last week I said we would start in looking at the dimension of impartation in terms of intercessory prayer. I thought we'd do that all last week. And then I said, well, it'll take a second week. We'll do it this week. Based on my studying this morning, it it may take two more weeks. There's just so much here. So let's, um, let's review what we have so far. First of all, Um, in Colossians chapter 1. We'll look at Colossians 1. We'll we'll look at a couple of these review passages and then then we're going to head over to Isaiah 53 again. In Colossians 1, our, our key verse is Colossians 1, 24. Paul says, Now I rejoice in my sufferings, on your behalf. He's speaking not only to the Colossian church, but to all of his churches, all the churches within his apostolic network. I rejoice in my sufferings for you, and I fill up the things lacking 
in the afflictions, in the tribulations, in the sufferings of Christ, in my flesh for his body, which is the church. And then he says, of which I became a servant. I became a minister. The, the Greek word for servant and the Greek word for minister, it's the same word. In other words, we translate it minister, but the actual Greek is servant. Paul is saying that in his ministry as the servant that the Lord has raised up, he's going to fill up what is lacking in the body of Christ. And fill up has to do with impartation. Um, he also said in verse 23 before this that he was the servant. The very last thing uh, that he talks about, about he's talking about this hope of the gospel in verse 23 and the final phrase in verse 23 of which I, Paul, became a servant. Now this whole idea of the servant of the Lord has to do with Paul's apostolic stewardship, apostolic commissioning, apostolic ministry to impart what the church needs to mature. The goal, of course, in verse 28 says that we proclaim Christ, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom so that we may present every man mature in Christ. The impartation, it's an impartation of wisdom, and that's, that's very significant. In this passage, Paul mentions wisdom three times. He prays in verse 9. He says, for this reason we also, that's Paul and his apostolic team, we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. The wisdom that Paul is praying for them, the wisdom that Paul wants to impart unto them is the wisdom that verse 28 says will bring this maturity to the body of Christ. And he has a third mention of wisdom as we go over in chapter 2. Uh, in chapter 2 he says, I want you to know what great agony I have for you and those in Laodicea and for as many as have not seen my face in the flesh. The Colossian church was part of, of, a, of, a, of a, an area uh, in which the Colossian church and the Laodicean church both existed. Paul didn't actually found those churches, but as it says in chapter 1, a member of his apostolic team founded the church in Colossae. And he says, um, for as many as have not seen my face in the flesh, that their hearts might be encouraged, being knit together in love and attaining to all the riches of the full assurance of understanding to the knowledge of the mystery of God, uh, both of the Father and of Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. There's the third mention of wisdom. So it's a wisdom to understand who the Father is, a wisdom to understand who the Son is, a wisdom to understand the gospel, a wisdom to attain maturity, and a wisdom to have their hearts knit together in love for the church to be in unity, just as the Father and Son are in unity. So wisdom is what Paul is looking to impart. Now we said there's a fourfold pattern of impartation. Paul starts off uh, that he gives thanks in verse 3 for the Colossians. Part 1, the fourfold pattern of how an apostolic leader who is the servant of the Lord imparts wisdom to attain maturity, to see who the Lord is, to accomplish unity in the body of Christ is thanksgiving. The apostle himself is in a right relationship with the Lord. He gives thanks to the Lord. He worships the Lord. His life is in order with the Lord. His life embraces the wisdom of Christ, the mystery of Christ, the mission of Christ, the purpose of Christ. Thanksgiving. The second, we saw Paul talked about praying here. He, 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 he is praying for this church. Prayer, intercession is part of the process of impartation. The third, 
And what he's talking about in the whole first chapter is this proclamation of the gospel. And then the fourth, Paul says, I rejoice in my sufferings. Paul suffers. So we give thanks, we intercede, we proclaim, that is we declare and we teach the truth, we suffer, and when you put those things together, impartation comes. Now, suffering is, is, is very important. Paul is writing this epistle to the Colossians from prison. So he is literally working out suffering. He's in prison because of the gospel. Now, on our way to the Old Testament, let's stop in Galatians chapter 1. We looked at this last week. Paul has already referred to himself as a servant of the Lord, a servant of the gospel. In Galatians chapter 1, Paul is talking about his own historical biography. Galatians 1 says, uh, we start in verse 11, But I make known to you, brethren, the gospel which was preached by me is not according to man. It, it, it didn't come from man. It came from the Lord. The Lord is the source of it. It's a vision of Jesus that imparts Paul's apostolic revelation, apostolic mission, and apostolic authority. For I neither received it from man, nor was I taught it, but it came through the revelation of Jesus Christ, of seeing the Lord. For you have heard of my former conduct in Jerusalem, how I persecuted the church of God beyond measure and tried to destroy it. And I advanced in Judaism beyond many of my contemporaries in my own nation, being more exceedingly zealous for the tradition of my fathers. But when it pleased God, who separated me from my mother's womb and called me through his grace to reveal his son in me, that I might preach him among the Gentiles. Now, I got to get in the light here, so to speak. <clears throat> Paul calls himself a servant. Paul talks about being separated from his mother's womb by the Lord, and then this brings us, of course, into Isaiah, the book of Isaiah. And in Isaiah 40 through 66, we have, particularly Isaiah 40 through 55, which is known as second Isaiah. And let's, let's go to Isaiah 49 right now. We have this revelation of the servant of the Lord. There are four servant songs or servant passages, servant texts that take place in Isaiah 40 through 55. The first is Isaiah 42, 1 through 9. We looked at that last week. The second is Isaiah 49, 1 through 7. I want you to go there right now. We looked at that briefly last week. Isaiah 54 through 11. We have not looked at that yet. We'll get a chance to look at it. And then, of course, we're going to get to Isaiah 52, 13 through the end of Isaiah 53, 53, 12, the fourth servant song, the fourth servant text. Now, remember, Paul referred to himself in these terms. He referred to himself that he was separated by the Lord from his mother's womb. Now, that's a direct reference to the third servant song, Isaiah 49, 1. Listen to me, O coastlands, give attention, you peoples from afar. The Lord called me from the womb, from the body of my mother. He named my name. He separated me from my mother's womb. He continues, he made my mouth like a sharp sword. In the shadow of his hand, he hid me. He made me a polished arrow. In his quiver, he hid me away. And he said to me, you are my servant, Israel, in whom I will be glorified. Israel is called collectively to be the servant of the Lord. Jesus prophetically becomes the individual who lives out the history and purpose of Israel in his own personal history to fulfill the purposes of the Lord. We know that when we move from Isaiah 53 to Isaiah 54, Isaiah 53 is the final mention of the servant of the Lord. Isaiah 54 then talks about how the servant births many servants. We become servants of the Lord 
because he is the servant of the Lord. And we want to see the relationship between Paul's suffering, that aspect, uh, embracing the aspect of suffering that the servant of the Lord embraces in Isaiah 53, in particular today, to show you how the process of impartation works. But we'll continue verse 4 of 49, but I said I've labored in vain, I've spent my strength for nothing and vanity, yet surely my right is with the Lord and my recompense is with my God. Surely my justice is with the Lord and the payment for fulfilling God's purpose is with him as well. The justice, it means the, the, the judicial decision rendered in the court of heaven declares that the servant of the Lord in Isaiah 49 will be raised up to accomplish the Lord's purposes. This is the servant speaking here. This is, Paul will embrace what the servant's doing, but we always want to understand where all of this starts. It starts with Jesus, first and foremost. Verse 5, and now the Lord says, he who formed me from the womb to be his servant. See, there's those two two references to separating me from my mother's womb. Paul has identified his ministry with the servant of the Lord. And then the suffering that he talks about in Colossians 1, verse 24, in verse 23, before that verse, and in verse 25, after that verse, he designates himself the servant of the Lord. So there's this identification between Jesus's apostolic ministry as the servant of the Lord and Paul's apostolic ministry. Jesus is the model for apostolic ministry and Jesus imparts the authority for us to move in that apostolic ministry. And what we're trying to recognize in Colossians 1 is the apostolic ministry of the Lord involves teaching, discipleship, proclamation, but it also entails impartation, and we want to see how that impartation comes to pass today, particularly in light of intercessory prayer. He says in verse 6, now let's, let's repeat verse 5, and now the Lord says, he who formed me from the womb to be his servant, to bring Jacob back to him, and that Israel might be gathered to him, for I am honored in the eyes of the Lord, and my God has become my strength. He said, it is too small of a thing, too light of a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to bring back the chosen ones of Israel. I will make you a light to the nations and my salvation so that my salvation may reach to the end of the earth. The, the apostolic ministry of the servant will involve both bringing Israel to the Lord and bringing the nations to the Lord. Now, the fourth servant song then begins in Isaiah 52, and it is this particular song, this particular passage that emphasizes the suffering of the servant. The first passage of the servant, Isaiah 42, emphasizes he's going to bring justice. The second passage Isaiah 49, which we just read, he is going to bring the mission of the Lord to all the earth, to the nations of the earth. The third in, in Isaiah 50, which we haven't looked at, but I'll summarize it, is that he's going to make disciples who will follow him as a model to be the servants of the Lord in the spirit of his being the servant. And then this fourth passage deals with the dimension of suffering. Keep a hand in Isaiah 52 here. Just keep a finger in there and, and look briefly at Acts chapter 9. The, this, this verse needs to be mentioned as well in light of what Paul said in Colossians, what Paul said in Galatians. This is what was said by the Lord of Paul or to Paul in Acts chapter 9. Paul is converted. He has a, an encounter with Jesus on the road to Damascus. He has a revelation of Christ. This is the revelation of Christ that Paul is alluding to in, in 
uh, Galatians chapter 1. The Lord separated me from my mother's womb, and when it all worked out in history that he would reveal Christ to me was on the road to Damascus. And Paul is blinded by this vision. They take him into the city. The Lord sends a prophetic brother, Ananias, to go declare a prophetic word to Paul concerning the implications of the call that Jesus has on his life now. You have to see how that relates. This is so important to understanding legitimate ministry in the body of Christ. Legitimate ministry, even though Paul you know, makes it clear in Galatians, the Lord and the Lord alone called me. Man didn't call me. That doesn't mean that man isn't involved in the call of an apostle or the call of a prophet or the call of someone in the ministry. Jesus appears to Paul and calls Paul, but then Jesus sends a prophet to connect Paul to the body of Christ, connect Paul to God's people, and to explain to Paul the implication of Jesus' call. We need not that any man teach us or instruct us, but we need to be connected to the body of Christ. We need to be accountable to the body of Christ. So Paul has Ananias come to him, and then Ananias prophesies this over Paul. This is what the Lord instructs Ananias to declare. It's in Acts 9, 15. But the Lord said to Ananias, Go, go to Paul, for he is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name. He carries my name. The suffering servant carries the burden of the Lord to God's people. And in Isaiah 53, that's what the servant does. And in Acts 9, this sets in motion what Paul is going to do in Galatians and Colossians and other places. Go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the nations and kings and the children of Israel. See, that's Isaiah 49. It's Israel and its kings, and it's the nations. And we'll, we'll see kings and nations and Israel in Isaiah 53 as well. And then the Lord adds this to what Ananias has de declared to Paul. For I will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. He ties in the very mission, the success of the mission, to carry the name of the Lord to nations, kings, and the sons of Israel, he ties it in specifically with suffering. Why? Because it's suffering that will impart the wisdom for people to see the Lord, for people to understand the gospel, for people to mature and become everything that God desires them to become. Okay, back to Isaiah 52. Fourth servant song starts in 52.13, but I want to back up two verses, 52.11 and 52.12. 52.11 says, depart, depart. It's an exhortation to Israel. Depart, depart, go out from there. Touch no unclean thing. Go out from the midst of her. Purify yourselves, you who bear the vessels of the Lord. They're coming out of Babylon. Remember Isaiah 40 through 55, 40 through 66 is addressed to those among Israel who are returning from the Babylonian exile. And they are in an unclean nation, a nation ruled by pagan gods, pagan politics, pagan economics, pagan worldview, pagan view of life, just as we in America. Pagan. The kingdom of God is separate from any political entity that exists in the earth. So the first reference as this fourth servant song is going to emerge is, a, is a, a, a word that refers to the return from the exile. The second in verse 12, the second reference, for you shall not go out in haste, you shall not go in flight, for the Lord will go before you and the God of Israel will guard you from behind. He will lead you from in front and guard you from behind. And that's a reference to the Exodus. So it's a reference to the past when God brought the children of Israel out of Egypt. 
and it's a reference to a present time when God is bringing the children of Israel out of Babylon. So there's this context. And you have to remember everything about the Exodus and the exile kind of sum up God's work with his people in human history. Do you, do you know this? And you don't have to turn to this, but let, let, let me quote this for you. I mean, I want, I want you to stay in Isaiah. We have to stay in Isaiah here uh, to finish everything we're looking at. <clears throat> I'm going to read to you the beginning of the Gospel of Mark. Mark is, is uh, unique. Uh, Mark's Gospel starts with just the ministry of Jesus. Matthew's Gospel starts with the birth of Jesus. Luke's Gospel starts with the birth of Jesus. John's Gospel starts with Jesus in eternity, before the human creation, before human history takes place. The Word is with God. But Mark starts with the ministry of of Jesus. The, the gospel itself starts with the ministry of Jesus. And this is how Mark 1 begins. In the beginning of the gospel of Jesus the Messiah, the Son of God, as it is written in Isaiah the prophet, behold, I send my messenger before your face. I send my angel before your face who will prepare your way. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Now, it's interesting. The Gospel of Mark is summed up with a reference to the Exodus, the coming out of Egypt, and a reference to Isaiah 40 through 55, the coming out of exile. Just as this fourth servant song ties together the imagery of Exodus and exile, freedom from Egypt, return from Babylon, it's saying that the, the very Gospel of Jesus, God's eschatological purposes as unveiled in all of scripture are centralized in this imagery of being set free from slavery in Egypt and then being returned from exile in Babylon. Even though Mark 1 says the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, Jesus the Messiah, the Son of God, as it is written in Isaiah the prophet, he does quote Isaiah the prophet in verse 3, but verse 2, he quotes Exodus. Behold, I send my angel before your face, who will prepare your way, which is also a quote from Malachi. So you got a quote here. There's this, this uh, package deal of imagery coming together that quotes Exodus, Isaiah, and Malachi. Exodus, the beginning of the Jewish nation. Isaiah the reestablishment of the nation of Israel when it looked like it was going to be destroyed in Babylon. And then Malachi, which is, of course, the final prophetic book, the final book of the Christian Old Testament, which talks about when the children of Israel come back and they rebuild the city and they restore the temple. So, so the gospel itself is it's exodus, exile, and return from exile, and the building of Zion and the reestablishment of Jerusalem. So when we look at these servant songs and when we look at Paul's apostolic mission, when we look at the gospel as it's declared in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, that's, this is what apostolic ministry is all about. This is what the kingdom of heaven is all about. All these dimensions, freedom from slavery, return from exile, and rebuilding the city and the temple. And, and that imagery, of course, we could teach on each one of those, and, and we, we teach frequently on all three of those, but we need to understand that's the prelude to the fourth servant song. So here's the fourth servant song. All right. The fourth servant song reads, it starts with this in verse 13. See, look. Pay attention. Turn to the Lord. Focus. See, it says, my servant shall act wisely. Paul is imparting what in Colossians? Wisdom. Wisdom to understand God's will. Wisdom to see the Lord. Wisdom to grow in maturity. 
wisdom to see the significance of the unity of the church. And this is talking about, see, my servant will act wisely. See, Paul understood Isaiah 52, 13, as setting in motion his apostolic imperative that he seeks to impart. Now, we talked about this last week. There, the, this word could mean, um, it, it means to act wisely. It means to gain spiritual insight from the Lord to understand his purposes. And it also can refer to the actions that proceed from wisdom that help the purposes of the Lord to succeed. It also can mean, and Klaus Baltzer's translation translates it, see my servant shall be beatified. Beatified means to be brought into a heavenly, divine, supernatural reality and be transformed so as to accomplish divine, heavenly purposes. See, the apostolic ministry sees Jesus. Paul sees Jesus and he goes blind. John sees Jesus in Revelation 1 and he falls at his feet as dead. The apostles who are hiding in fear see the risen Jesus and they are empowered. They are inspired. And he spends 40 days and 40 nights teaching them about the kingdom and then he sends his spirit in Acts chapter 1 to give them the authority to do these things. See, that's what it means to be beatified. The apostles are beatified. They are made beautiful. They are made beautiful. They are supernaturally endowed with wisdom to teach and to impart and to train and disciple and to raise up the church to enter into the purposes of the Lord. See, my servant shall act wisely. And then three words. He shall be very high. He shall be raised up very high. He shall be lifted up, and he shall be highly exalted. Now, those three words all speak of different stages, different, of, different stages of, 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 of exaltation. To be made high has to do with uh, rising up. It has to do with ascending into kingship, a royal ascent to be Carried to be lifted up means God himself will support the servant. The servant can't do anything unless he himself is carried by the Lord. Now we pointed out last week that the servant is going to end up carrying some things, but he's only going to carry those things because he is first carried by the Lord. As servants of the Lord, as, as five-fold ministers, as leaders, as 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 apostolic disciplers, we must first be carried up by the Lord. Our ascent must be that the Lord raises us up so that we in turn can raise others up. He imparts something to us that we may impart something to others. The second is the, the, the second aspect here is that he's raised up, and the third aspect is that he will be exalted on high. This will be, this will be a, a heavenly establishment. Remember, remember when Paul in Philippians 2 talked about Jesus, and in Philippians 2 it talks about Jesus humiliating himself, Jesus suffering, Jesus humbling himself. But then the Lord would raise him up and give him a name highly exalted above all the names of the earth. That's what that comes when, when Paul's talking about that in Philippians chapter 2. He's talking about that from Isaiah chapter 52. Now, let's establish from this language what the purposes of the Lord is, or what the purposes of the Lord are, I should say. There is a purpose, the purposes are varied, one single purpose. This language, high and lifted up, 
brings us back to the early chapters in Isaiah. In fact, Isaiah 40 through 55, it's summarizing much of what Isaiah in 1st Isaiah chapter 1 through 39 in, in, in the historical life of Isaiah, the events and the prophecies. Let's look at one of the earliest prophecies in Isaiah. Go to Isaiah chapter 2. Isaiah 2 says this. Isaiah 2, verse 1. The word of the Lord that Isaiah the son of Amos saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem, it shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the house of the Lord shall be established as the highest of mountains and shall be lifted up above the hills. Nasa. It will be lifted up above the hills just as the servant is lifted up, so shall the house of the Lord be lifted up. It shall be established and it shall be lifted up. And all nations shall flow to it. And many peoples shall come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us his ways, that we may walk in his path. For out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He, the Lord, shall judge between the nations and shall decide disputes for many peoples. They shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. Now, the exaltation of the servant corresponds to the exaltation of Zion, the exaltation of the house of the Lord, and of course, the exaltation of the Lord himself. In verse 11, it says, The haughty looks of man shall be brought low in that day when the house of the Lord, through the exalted servant of the Lord, when the house of the Lord is exalted, the haughty looks of man shall be brought low, the lofty pride of men shall be humbled, and the Lord alone will be exalted in that day. So the servant is, is, is being lifted up, is, is being raised up on high, is being highly exalted so that the servant might accomplish the purposes of the Lord. And we see in Isaiah 2 what those purposes are. Now, this is interesting. All the nations, there's image in Scripture where the nations come up against Jerusalem to do what? To destroy Jerusalem. But Isaiah does not portray that image. He portrays the nations coming up to Israel to worship the Lord, not to destroy Jerusalem, not to destroy the people of God, but to worship the Lord. Isaiah's is a peaceful revolution. And the reason for that peaceful revolution will be, of course, discerned by the ministry of the servant in Isaiah 53. Now, that, that term of being high and exalted, of course, also brings us to Isaiah chapter 6. Isaiah's commissioning, he sees Yahweh, he sees the Lord high and exalted, and it's the same words that are applied to the servant in Isaiah 52. Isaiah 6, 1 says, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up just as the servant is raised up on high, just as the servant is lifted up, just as the servant is highly exalted. Isaiah started his ministry by seeing this picture of the Lord highly exalted. So for Isaiah to prophesy that the servant, behold, my servant shall be high and exalted, there's an identification between Yahweh and the servant of Yahweh. Notice the king dies, and that's when the... Isaiah sees the Lord as king. That's, we saw that in the Psalms constantly. It's only when David, David's seed, is removed from the throne, there's no more king of David, uh, of, of, of David's descendants, that Yahweh becomes king in the Psalms. And it's Yahweh's kingship that establishes the purposes of the Lord in the earth. 
this, this death of Uzziah and this seeing of the Lord, he sees that human leadership is not necessary in the equation. Human political leadership is not necessary in the equation to fulfill the purposes of the Lord. It's there in Scripture. I'm saying it every week to try to say, please, people, please throw away who's president as being the ultimate issue. It, in fact, is a not an issue. It's not an issue. It's the kingship of the Lord. And these patterns are shown over and over and over and over and over and over in Scripture. It's about who is our king. Yahweh is king. And there's this always this contrast in Scripture between the failures of human leadership and the success of divine leadership. So in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. It's, a, it's the kingship of Yahweh here that is, is coming to the forefront and the kingship of Uzziah to the background. Remember Uzziah, Uzziah kind of ended up bad, but Uzziah had one of the longest reigns of any king in 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 Israel and Judah's history. And for the most part, his reign was just, it was, the nation was blessed and prosperous under Uzziah. He dies and now the Lord's saying, good, don't worry about it. This is this good king that, that established all this good political reality in Israel. He's dead, who cares? Who cares? The Lord is king. And the train of his robe fills the temple. And of course, Isaiah sees the Lord for who he is. Now, if we go back and we pick back up in Isaiah, verse 13, we'll repeat again. See, look, behold, my servant will act wisely. He will be raised on high, he'll be lifted up, and he'll be highly exalted. And you go from this incredible perspective, this beatified kingly figure of the servant, and then the language just changes immediately. It goes from, from heaven to hell in the beat of a second. It says, as many were appalled at you, as the many. And remember, this whole idea of the many is, is, is significant. It's going to be mentioned five times. The many are going to be mentioned here. And that's a term Paul used to talk about the church. He called the church in the New Testament the many. He said, as many were appalled at you, his appearance was so marred, so disfigured, beyond human assemblance, or beyond human semblance, and his form beyond that of the Son of Man. The language to be appalled means to be terrified. It is actually a word that has within it implications of being terrified by a demonic apparition. There, it, we go from this, this king who's highly exalted in the presence of Yahweh to one who is so disfigured, doesn't even look human, has even demonic implications, brings fear, and, and you're like, what, what, what's, what's happening here? It continues in verse 13. Yet, or verse 15, Yet this one shall sprinkle many nations. Kings shall shut their mouths because of him. For that which has not been told them, they will see. So the many are Israel here. Back in, in, uh, in verse 14, Israel's terrified. The many nations and kings are, are going to close their mouths and are going to be sprinkled, and sprinkled speaks of, of a, it's, it's, a, it's a religious dimension, a, a, a dimension of taking what is unclean and Im, uh, impure and purifying it, sprinkling it, m- moving something from the realm of the profane to the holy, from the unclean to the clean. So this, the images are mixed, are, are mixed here, this exalted ruler, is disfigured and almost looks demonic 
and yet is somehow going in this, this impure state. You know, in heaven, the servant is holy. <laughs> On the earth, disfigured, unholy, and yet this holy, unholy dichotomy is going to make the nations who are impure pure. They're going to be sprinkled. So the imagery, imagine somebody hearing this prophecy for the first time. You're all over the place. There, you're, you're all, you're, where is this going? Well, this is where it's going. The purposes of the Lord will be established for Israel and the nations, as Isaiah 49 read, through suffering. This is, this is how the impartation is going to take place. Now that, uh, uh, they're going to shut their mouths. They shut their mouths in, in honor of this, this incredible kingly figure who doesn't look very kingly. You shut your mouth in the face of glory and honor. But it also this sprinkling moving from the realm of the unholy to the holy is going to have to do with that which has not been told them they will see and that which they have not heard they will understand. Keep your hands in Isaiah 53 and go right back to Isaiah 6. When Isaiah saw the Lord high and lifted up, when he sees him at the start of his ministry, the Lord commissions him. And here's the prophetic word that Isaiah has at the start of his ministry. And I want you to see it's a contrast to his prophetic word here at the end of his ministry in Isaiah 52 and 53. Isaiah 6, 8. And I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? Then I said, Here am I, send me. And he said, Go and say to this people, Keep on hearing, but do not understand. Keep on seeing, but do not perceive. Make the heart of this people dull and their ears heavy. Blind their eyes, lest they see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their hearts and turn and be healed. Then I said, how long, O Lord? And he said, until cities be waste without inhabitants and homes without people and the land is a desolate waste and the Lord removes people far away and the forsaken places are many in the midst of Israel. Isaiah's mission is to cause people not to see, not to hear, not to understand. For what reason? because they're going to be exiled until they're driven far away. But you see, and we can go back to Isaiah 52, now it's the return from exile and the very thing the Lord set in motion. They're not going to see, they're not going to understand. Now he's saying they're going to see and they're going to understand. That which has not been told them, they will see, and that which they have not heard, they will understand. And see, that's the wisdom. Behold, my servant acts wisely. He's going he's gonna to fulfill the purposes of the Lord. Where people have been blind, they're going to see. Where people haven't heard, where they're deaf, they're going to hear. Where people have been unhealed, they're going to be healed. That healing that was uh, implied there, in, in, or that was implicit in the, the prophecy of Isaiah, even though you're going to send the people into exile and blind them, that's going to be until I heal them. And now Isaiah is saying, well, now the time has come. He is healing them. They're going to return from exile. Why? Because see my servant, my servant. It's all about seeing Jesus. That's why Paul, in this whole apostolic impartation that he's discussing, in Colossians 1, he, he, he talked about seeing all the mysteries of God and in Christ contained in Jesus, contained in the gospel. It's now going to be imparted. What has not been understood, what has not been seen is going to be understood and going to be seen because of Jesus. And now, as I come in the spirit of the servant of the Lord, I'm going to be able to impart Christ unto you. I'm going to be able to bring the revelation of Jesus to you. And when I bring the revelation of Jesus to you, that which is lacking in the body of Christ will be filled up. Oh, but by the way, just as the impartation came in Isaiah 52 and 53 through the suffering of the servant, so will the impartation come through suffering. 
The body of Christ is full of thanksgiving. The body of Christ is full of proclamation, apostolic, prophetic proclamation. It's full of teaching. It's full of prayer. But a church unwilling to suffer, a church unwilling to suffer, has lacked the impartation of wisdom to really see Jesus and to really enter into that full maturity that the body of Christ needs to attain to the fullness of stature of Christ. See, you have to understand, this is true specifically, primarily for America. Where are the greatest revivals in the world taking place right now in the church? China. What's happening to the church in China? The church is suffering. Iran. What's happening to the church in Iran that opens up the door to this great revival? Suffering. Across the continent of Africa. What's happening in Africa? Suffering. And America, meanwhile, the church is focused in on voting for a presidential candidate who will Remove suffering from our lives. Wake up, church. Wake up, church. There is a great awakening beginning. There is a great awakening that's going to take place. There is a great awakening that God is going to do in America. But it's going to be, to quote Pastor Jan, who quoted Pastor Todd Smith that we heard this past weekend, revival is painful. When the Lord presses into us, Jan and I, most of us, we use the language, we got to press into God. But Pastor Todd Smith used the, the term when the Lord presses into us. So we have to let the Lord press into us. See, Paul says, I rejoice in my sufferings for you. I called them Christological suffering. Christological suffering is suffering that focuses on Christ as being central and that focuses on the gospel being central, that focuses on the purposes of God, the kingdom purposes of the Lord established in the earth. The church has to be prepared to suffer. See, Paul is even saying, I mean, why did the first century church explode? Why was there a revival there? Well, the first century church suffered. But even in, in, in the epistle to the Colossians, which Paul is writing in, you know, early 60 ADs, six, early 60s AD, 63, maybe 62, Paul is writing, he's saying the church doesn't understand how to suffer, even under Rome. And that's because we don't understand Christological suffering. Christological suffering is that we suffer on behalf of Christ. We suffer for Christ. We suffer because of Christ. We suffer unto Christ. We suffer for the sake of the gospel. Now, this is not salvific suffering. Isaiah 53 is Jesus suffers so that we might be saved. This is eschatological suffering. We, we don't add anything to salvation. We don't cause salvation through our suffering. That comes through Christ and Christ alone. But the church has to learn to separate salvific and eschatological categories. Eschatology means how we live out our lives as disciples, how we live out our lives as, Christ, as, as kingdom Christians. Eschatology means that Jesus saves us and he alone can save us, but he saves us for a purpose to establish his kingdom purposes in human history. And what are those kingdom purposes? Well, that the Lord will be high and lifted up and his train will fill the temple. It's the kingship of God is being established in the earth. No human political kingship. The kingship of God is being established. And it's also so that the nations will come to Zion. The nations will come to Jerusalem. That the nations of the earth will be converted to the worship of the Lord. Converted to the gospel. Converted to the kingship of the Lord. So then Isaiah 53, we go right into chapter 1. Who has believed what we heard... And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? Now, they're looking at verses 
13, 14, and 15, and now the people, because remember what's taking place. This is in the heavenly courtroom of the Lord. The language here is, is has to do with, with the servant of the Lord comes into the courtroom of the Lord, and the courtroom of the Lord, that whole situation started in Isaiah 40. Uh, as our church has been reading Isaiah 40 through 55, Isaiah 40 through 55 is the expanded version, the long version of Daniel 7. Daniel 7, the Son of Man, comes into the courtroom of the Lord and receives the kingdoms, the, the kingdom authority to have the final say in human history from the ancient of days. Well, Isaiah 40 through 55, it's the long version. I mean, I remember when I first heard uh, in high school uh, the two minute and 25 second version of Light My Fire by the Doors, which was the song of the year that year. And my mind was blown when I heard, come on, baby, light my fire. But then I went out and got in the album and I heard the long version, the seven minute version of Light My Fire, where you got to hear the, the keyboards and the, the guitar solos as well as the song. Well, Isaiah 40 through 55 is the album version. Mommy, Daddy, What's an album? Uh, it's the album version of Daniel chapter 7. And the whole thing takes place in the courtroom of the Lord. And what's taking place in the courtroom of the Lord, everybody in Isaiah, you have Israel, you have the nations, you have Babylon and Persia, you have the king of Babylon, you have Cyrus, the king of Persia, you have the heavenly council, you have the prophets, you have the idolaters, you have the, the sorcerers of Babylon, you have the wise men of Persia, you have Greece and the coastlands coming in and watching, and then you have Yahweh and the servant of the Lord. And what, what we're talking about here, this is the closing of this, this particular section Isaiah 40 through 55, and this servant is brought in, and now Yahweh is going to render a verdict about the servant of the Lord and how he is central to the outworking of God's kingdom purposes in human history. And so now in the background, as the, the servant, as the servant has been identified with all these diverse images in 52, 13, 14, and 15, the heavenly council cries out, who has believed what we have heard? Who has believed what he has heard from us? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? Unto whom has the arm of the Lord been disclosed, unveiled, shown, revealed? And the, the, the arm of the Lord is the, it's the, the, it's the power of the Lord the arm stands for the power of the Lord to work out his purposes in human history. It usually speaks of military might. It usually speaks of victory in warfare. To whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? It goes back to Exodus 15, the song of Moses and the song of Miriam, when the Lord delivered the children of Israel from Egypt. And they begin to sing about how Yahweh has bared his arm, has revealed his arm in human history, and it, it, this, this word for revealed speaks of the full disclosure in human history of something that's been hidden. So they want to know, who's seen the arm of the Lord? Now, see, that's normal military language. But see, all of Isaiah 53 contradicts military battle. It's not Yahweh's going to come in and crush the nations. Yahweh's going to come in and destroy the nations. Remember the disciples when Jesus came? Lord, when are, when, when are you going to crush the nations? When, when are you going to crush Rome? When are you going to raise up this military move, this political move, this political manifestation of power? When are you going to do this and get the Romans off our back? And it never happened. It doesn't happen in Isaiah 53. They, they were thinking of other passages in Scripture that show Yahweh coming down and, and doing war against the enemies of God, but they weren't thinking of Isaiah. They weren't thinking of the suffering servant. The only war that takes place in Isaiah 53 
is that the Yahweh inflicts all of his wrath on his servant. There's no wrath on the nations and there's no wrath on Israel. The only place where we see wrath and warfare is Yahweh putting it upon his servant. This is a powerful picture, brother. See, the disciples may have gotten some scriptures right, but they didn't get this scripture right. And see, that's the that's a perfect picture of sectarian thinking. We get a few, well, we get a, oh, we get this passage over here right about the Lord crushing the nations in the Psalms. And oh, here's a passage from Zechariah, the Lord's crushing the nations. And oh, here's Exodus uh, where the Lord crushes the nations. And we say, the Lord's going to crush the nations. And we say, well, you know, you're, you're partially right. You got some of the picture there. There's, there's truth there, but, but you've left out Isaiah 53, how the Lord is going to crush the nations. He's going to crush the nations by crushing his servant. And the crushing that's going to take place on his servant is going to release thankfulness and worship and joy and the establishment of the kingship. And just as we see Jesus unveiled, others are going to see Jesus unveiled. And the nations will march up in pilgrimage, as Isaiah 2 says, to worship the Lord. Because the kings are going to see, many kings, many nations, the many in Israel are going to see Yahweh's heart for his creation. See, and, and this is what sectarian thinking does. We, you know, Christians pick out five verses and say, here's our gospel when there are 15 verses that sum up the gospel. You, the five you got are right, but you're missing 10. See, that's the full stature of Christ. And the way the full stature of Christ comes because, you know, your tradition has five of the aspects of the gospel, but somebody else's tradition has another five. Oh, and another tradition over here has three and another one has two. And when we come together in unity around Christ, which is what Paul was praying for in Colossians 1, for an impartation of wisdom that our hearts might be knit together in love to see the full riches of the mystery of Christ, the full stature of Christ. See, that's when we get all 15. To whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? Verse 2. For he grew up before him, like a young plant and like a root out of dry ground. And that's a reference, this, this, this root of Jesse, this branch of Jesse, this sprout of Jesse, Isaiah 11 prophesied about this. When, when the tree is cut down in Isaiah 6 verse 10, and all that's left is a stump, but there are these little sucklings, these little sprouts coming out, there is still life in that stump that's going to be restored when Israel comes back from the exile. And who's going to do it? The root of Jesse. So the language here in Isaiah 53 is going back to the messianic prophecies in Isaiah 11 verses 1 through 10. But there's also another image here. And this is something that, that I can already tell from our time that we're not going to be able to develop it this week. We'll develop it next week. The image in Isaiah 53, there's, there's the servant is described in imagery that not only speaks of David here, but it, it, it's heavily, it leans heavily to the description of Moses. Moses could be seen as the servant of the Lord. Now, now you remember when the, when the rabbis taught Isaiah 53 before Christ, when, when the Jews were, were trying to grapple with Isaiah 53, the question was always, of whom does the prophet speak when he refers to the servant? Does he speak of himself? Does he speak of Israel? Does he speak of another? And one of the, one of the answers was, he's speaking of Moses. Now, we could literally spend a whole week just looking at how the images, the, the descriptive language that is used in this particular passage, the, the language that's used, 
refers specifically to Moses. Moses can be seen as the servant of the Lord. Now, we all know when this passage was made, Moses is dead and gone. But remember, you gotta, you got to remember the Jews reading the Old Testament before we have the New Testament. We have, we have the advantage of hindsight. We, we have the New Testament already. But the Jews who are reading this, Moses died. But where was Moses buried? See, the Lord took Moses when he died, and it said the Lord buried Moses. The Lord, the Lord took Moses into a secret place by himself. And so th this idea, remember this courtroom scene that's going on in Isaiah 40 through 55, it's in heaven, it's on the earth, and it's actually in the underworld. It, at, at points in Isaiah 40 through 55, the courtroom scene goes right down into hell, right down into Hades, right down into the grave. Well, Moses is in the grave. Moses is dead. And there's this idea of what we call a Moses redivivus. Moses resurrected. Moses brought back. Moses coming for a, a second appearance. Moses resurrected. And so th this idea was that the servant of the Lord might be the Lord raising up Moses. Well, what's important about that imagery is, see, sometimes as you're thinking things through in Scripture, you, to get there, you have to think correctly to get there. And they were actually thinking correctly because they are understanding someone who dies is going to have to be raised from the dead to become the servant of the Lord. See, and so it was that, that, that pre-Christian thinking among the Jews that would have informed the disciples at the time of Christ. It should have informed that yeah, maybe Jesus would die and be raised from the dead. Now, they, they, they weren't expecting that. They missed it. Every time he'd say, I'm going to die and be raised from the dead. No, 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 no. See, they, they really were missing Isaiah. They, they seem to be getting a lot of other things right, but they were leaving out Isaiah. In tying this in with Moses, a lot of the early language, let, let me see if maybe I, I, I can do a... Um, let me do a brief summary, and maybe we'll, we'll go back into it in a little more depth next week. I, I have a little summary sheet here that I, I need to find here. It's, um, it's in Balzer's commentary where he kind of sums up uh, all the different passages uh, that are alluded to in, in this particular uh, place. And to quote my wife, of course I can't find it. Okay, this this will make my job a little bit easier here if I can find this somewhere. See, I, I, it's a sin to write in books, so I, I don't write in my books. I, I did find it here. As we go through the language of the suffering servant, there are references here, first of all, to the burden that the Lord put upon Moses, the burden that he carried. Remember we said earlier that the, this, this servant, my servant in Isaiah 52, 13, I will carry him. That's the Hebrew word nasa. I will carry him as a burden. And the Hebrew word for burden is masa. Nasa means to carry a burden. Masa means the burden itself. There's reference in here Moses, as he was leading the children of Israel out of Israel, carried the burden of the people. There is language here that refers to the sorrows. When, when, when Moses saw Yahweh in the burning bush and the Lord spoke to him, he said, I've heard my people's cries and I've seen their sorrows. The sorrows that the suffering servant would bear would be the sorrows of God's people in exile. Just as Moses heard Yahweh say, I'm sending you to relieve them of their burdens. Moses carries this burden all throughout the journey from Egypt into the promised land. There's, an, there's an, a picture here of the servant being acquainted with sickness, of carrying sickness, of being actually made sick. 
and there's that image of it's it's interesting because uh you know Psalm 22 is where the rabbis called the Messiah the afflicted one. Uh, Jesus crying out on the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me from Psalm 22? And in it, it says, you will not ignore the affliction of the afflicted one. The the Lord's, Jesus is crying it out. That's what David is saying in Psalm 22, that the Lord does not ignore the affliction of his afflicted ones. And they gave that as a title of the Messiah, the afflicted one, from Psalm 22. Well, they gave the title from Isaiah 53, the leprous one. The particular sickness that is associated here in Isaiah 53 with Moses. Remember Moses, uh, when when in, in Exodus chapter 4, after the Lord tells him, I want you to go and speak to Pharaoh. And he says, I don't want to go and speak to Pharaoh. And I can't speak. Well, Aaron will speak for you. Well, I can't do this. Well, I'll take care of that. And finally, he says, well, you got to give me a sign so the people will believe me. And he gives them two signs. He says, take your staff, the staff which speaks of Moses' authority and his ability to lead God's people and the power to carry that out. He said, cast your staff on the ground and it'll turn into a serpent. That was one sign. The other sign was take your hand. And the hand of the Lord, Numbers, speaks of the Lord commanding Moses to lead the people through the wilderness, out of Egypt, through the wilderness, by his hand. The hand of Moses, the hand of healing, the hand of leading, the hand of of God's ability to bring his people into the land. He would take his hand, this was the second sign, take your hand, your hand of healing, your staff of authority, put it in your garment, And when you take it out, it'll become leprous. And so the images of Moses' authority have a mixture of divine and demonic, just as with the servant here, a staff that turns into a serpent. Staff is divine, serpent is demonic. A hand speaks of the divine healing. You lay your hands on someone to heal, you stick it in here and it comes out leprous. There's this association between the divine and the demonic, between healing and sickness in Moses. We also see that with the servant who who carries the pain of God's people and bears up their sicknesses that they might be healed. Well, that's the leprous one. We also saw that, you know, we we also see this, this idea of the servant being smitten and being smitten means to be smitten with a stroke or being smitten with a plague. All these uh, issues of sickness and illness and disease that the servant will take upon himself. Well, Moses is constantly dealing with the plague. He's dealing with leprosy. Remember Miriam, when Miriam and Aaron rebelled against Moses' authority. Who do you think you are? We, we have authority too. Miriam was struck with leprosy. And what does Moses do in all these situations? He intercedes. When, when um, the spies go out and they return with a bad report, the Lord sends a plague. Moses intercedes for them and the plague is gone. When Miriam is smitten with leprosy, Moses intercedes and Miriam is healed. When Dathan and Abiram rebel against Moses and Aaron and the ground opens up and swallows them and then the Lord sends a plague to get everybody else, Moses intercedes for them. When the serpents in the wilderness begin to, the poisonous, toxic serpents begin to bite God's people and kill them, Moses raises up a serpent in the wilderness and the people look to that serpent and they're healed. When the children of Israel worship the golden calf, Moses says, blot my name out. Don't destroy them. Blot my name out. Let me pay the price of their debt. And then the Lord says, all right, we'll bring the people into the land. See, this imagery, now watch when, 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 when we go through the imagery of the servant. It, it refers to Moses. Verse 2 again. 
for he, the servant of the Lord, grew up before him like a young plant, like a root out of dry ground, Egypt. He had no former majesty that we should look at him and no beauty that we should desire him. He doesn't look kingly. He looks demonic, as we saw in the previous few verse, uh, few verses of the previous chapter. Verse 3, he was despised and forsaken of men, a man of pain who knows illness. Now, there are going to be these different aspects about illness. Three, three times, three things are going to be said about illness. He knows illness here. He's acquainted with illness. Jesus in his ministry certainly was acquainted with illness. The sick and the demonized were constantly coming to him. And Moses as a prefiguring of this servant, Moses also is acquainted. He's acquainted with the disease. And, and the, the Hebrew words for sickness and disease can be physical sickness, it can be psychological sickness, it can be spiritual sickness. It covers the whole gamut. So you're looking here at three images. Jesus is our model. He's the fulfillment of Isaiah 53 on a salvific and an eschatological level. But you're looking at Moses, who is a foreshadowing of Christ, and then you're looking at Paul. One comes before Christ and gives you the image of Christ. Then one comes after Christ, and he's going to follow the model of Christ in his apostolic ministry. But Christ is at the center. Jesus fulfills this. Moses helps us to understand these images of the suffering servant, and they would also help Paul. Paul would see Jesus, but Paul knew Moses too, and Paul would have been familiar with the tradition that the suffering servant was like Moses. And one of the things that we see about Moses, wherever Moses is involved with the people, what is he doing? He's interceding for the people. And it is his intercession, like Paul's intercession, like our intercession. It's his intercession in the midst of a context of suffering, along with his thanksgiving to the Lord, along with his proclamation of the truth. Moses did all that. Paul does all that. We do all of that. That's what imparts the wisdom and the maturity to the church. Moses is willing to suffer. He doesn't lash out at the people of God. He's willing to take responsibility for their debts. Paul is willing to take responsibility for that which is lacking in the church. Significant implications. Back to verse 3. He's despised and rejected of man. He's forsaken. Paul says, all those who are in Asia have left me. Paul goes to prison, and you know what the Christians said when Paul is in prison? The Christians who constantly, Paul was attacked, slandered, berated constantly. He'd, he'd do these incredible things, establish church after church after church, and people who didn't have the apostolic authority to establish those churches in the kingdom purposes of the Lord, in the apostolic imperative of the Lord, would come into those churches after Paul had established them and just say, oh, Paul's this and Paul's that and Paul's this. He was dogged constantly. Just about every one of Paul's epistles, he always has to address the people who are attacking him. So can you imagine when he went to prison, what they said about him? If he's really the, the great apostle of the Lord, why is he in prison right now? And I'm sure they said the same things after he died. Well, see, look at, he got what, what he deserved. He wasn't really telling the truth. But Paul, instead of lashing back, Paul, like the servant, bears the pain, bears the debt, bears the failure, bears the weakness. He carries it with an intercessory burden and he prays for God's people to have an impartation of the truth. Boy, instead of fighting on Facebook, instead of fighting who's the president, instead of accusing people constantly because they don't live in the little world of, of Christianity that I live in, in my tradition, instead of doing that, 
if we would begin to pray for each other. If you've got the truth, good. Then pray for others to get an impartation of the same wisdom you have. That's what Paul is talking about. This is how you impart wisdom to the church in the midst of suffering. Try, I'm trying to, let's see, what do we got? We've got a couple minutes here to try to wrap this up. And obviously we'll have a part three next week, but I'm, I'm, I'm at least exposing you to a, a, a frame of reference how to deal with these things. He's forsaken and rejected of men, a man of pain, a man of sorrows, that's those sorrows that Israel was subjected to in Egypt, a man of sorrows who is acquainted with illness. We hid, as it were, our faces from him as one who was despised and we esteemed him not. Yet in the midst of this, yet surely he carried our sicknesses. He's acquainted with sickness, but he's more than acquainted. He carries with our sickness. And how does he carry our sickness? In intercessory prayer. He makes intercession in the midst of suffering, in the midst of proclaiming the truth, and in the midst of rejoicing. Christological intercession. Christological impartation. He carried our sickness and he was touched with the weight of our own sorrows. See, this is the second time he's carried by Yahweh in 52.13 so he can carry our sickness, so he can be touched with our pain. Yet we esteemed him stricken smitten of God and afflicted. We esteemed him to be stricken with a stroke, to be struck with the plague, to be an afflicted one, to be just simply a, one suffering for his own sin. But he was wounded for our transgressions he was crushed for our iniquities. The discipline of our peace, the peace that belongs to us, came upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. Now I want you to see, he, this, is, this is what God placed on him. God placed on him our transgressions. Transgressions, the Hebrew word means crimes. The Lord put our crimes on him. This is how he bears our sickness and carries our pain. Any pastor knows you're pastoring criminals. And the way you pastor criminals is you show them a, mercy, a, a mixture of mercy and love and kindness and occasionally confront them with their sin. But you bear with them. You stick with them. This is what it means to, to release what is lacking in the body of Christ. We have to look. Our people that are not in maturity, that refuse to suffer themselves, they're not there because they're incapable of being there. We, we have to, pastoring has to recognize the impossible situation that human beings are in. And we need to proclaim to them we need to teach them to give thanks. We need to pray for them, but we need to suffer for them as well. He's wounded for our crimes and he's crushed for our iniquities. Iniquities has to do, it's the word disaster. See, see, human beings are criminals and human beings live lives of disaster and they're crushed by that disaster. And they, they destroy the whole fabric of solidarity and unity in the church because of their crimes. But we're called for us to be crushed and for us to bear 
the implications of their crimes. This is how we suffer and then we impart to them what Jesus imparted to us. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Every person has turned to his own way, but Yahweh laid upon him the guilt of us all. Do you know what the word to place upon him, our guilt? It means to touch him with our guilt. It's the Hebrew word for intercession. Intercession means to be touched with something in someone else, to be touched with something by God. It means something meets together. Human beings' failure meets together with the Lord's servant, Jesus, in the person of Jesus, when Jesus puts sin upon Jesus. He touches them. It's the same Hebrew word for intercession. Intercession means we are touched by God with the disaster of other people's lives, with the crimes of other people's lives, the crimes that dissolve the unity of the body of Christ. And we are not responsible, but we take responsibility upon ourselves. Verse 7, he was oppressed, he was afflicted, he opened not his mouth like a lamb that is led to slaughter and like a sheep that before it shears is silent, so he opens not his mouth, he submits to the purposes of the Lord. Being quiet, Jesus being quiet when the Sanhedrin was accusing him, Jesus was submitting to the Father and he was taking their crimes and he was taking their pain and he was taking their sickness and he was taking their deceit and he was taking their disasters upon himself so that he could get on the cross and say, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. And when he did that, suffering righteously as we suffer Christologically, when we take upon ourselves the inability of God's people to get it, we can then intercede and say, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Oh, yes, and impart to them wisdom to get it. See, the eschatological purposes of the Lord are ultimately transformative. Verse 8, by oppression and judgment he was taken away, as for his generation who considered that he was cut off of the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people. Again, smitten with the plague for the crimes of my people. And they made his grave with the wicked, a righteous man being buried with the wicked. And sometimes pastoral and apostolic ministry, you're buried, brethren. You're buried in the midst of the disaster of human lives, the, the inability of the church to get some of the simplest things right. I mean, brethren, to me, it is an insult to the body of Christ, the political division that's right now, the simplistic simplicity of issues. Don't trust in princes. Don't trust in chariots. Don't trust in man. Trust in the Lord, but no, we want our king to take care of us. some of the simplest issues, being more in solidarity with political positions with the nation of America than with the people of God. But see, we can curse our brothers and sisters and tell them how stupid they are for that. Or we can say, I'm going to carry it, Brad. I'm going to carry my brothers and sisters. One thing the Lord has said to me the Lord says, son, you disagree significantly with your brothers and sisters in Christ about a lot of things, but do you love them? And I've had to come back with the simple answer. Yes, Lord, I disagree, but I'm going to love my brothers and sisters in Christ. They made his grave with the wicked and with a rich man in his death, although he'd done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth. By the way, the Hebrew word for violence is he had done no political violence, and the deceit is he had done no economic fraud. These, are, these, are, these have a lot of practical implications. Ep economic fraud, political violence, Lord, that's not your will, but we're going to bear our brothers and sisters. Yet it was the will of the Lord to do what? To crush the enemies of the Lord, to crush those unrighteous people, to crush those criminals, 
to crush those who literally deceive, uh, I mean, deserved their disasters because they brought them on themselves. No, the Lord crushes the servant and he puts him to grief. Literally in the Hebrew, he made him sick. He's acquainted with sickness. He bears their sickness. Actually, he's made sick. When his soul makes an offering for guilt, he shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days and the will of the Lord shall prosper in his hands. You know what the guilt offering is? It has to do with restitution and retribution. There are all kinds. There's sin offerings, burnt offerings. The guilt offering said, our sin, we owe something to God. We owe restitution to God for our sin. That's the guilt offering. The guilt offering is I owe restitution to where I've defrauded my brothers and sisters from their rights and and I've stolen their blessings. That's a guilt offering. It means the suffering servant says, I'll take on the liability of the debt of all my people and I'll offer my own soul for it so that I can see what? My seed. He shall see his offspring. He'll live forever. And the purposes of the Lord will prosper in his hands. How does a man who dies without children see his seed continue forever? Well, if he's raised from the dead. How does a, a, an apostolic leader who sees no success in what he's trying to raise up in the church, how does he see his seed continue? How does he see disciples form? By suffering and making intercession. By suffering for criminals, by taking on the debt and liability for people's debts. He becomes surety for them. That's the Goel Redeemer who would go in and take out of his own pocket and ransom his kinsmen who were enslaved because of their debt. Out of the anguish of his soul, he will see and he'll be satiated. He's going to see the purposes of God prosper. He's going to see real transformation. He's going to see real discipleship. He's going to see real revival. He's going to see a real awakening, but he's going to be part and parcel of it. This is Paul. We know it's Jesus, guys. We know how Moses did it. He constantly asked God to intercede. What was the ultimate sacrifice of Moses? Blot my name out of your book that they might live. What was Moses saying? I'll pay the debt myself. Well, Lord, these criminals I'm pastoring. Well, Lord, these disasters I'm trying to deal with, and people won't even listen to my advice. Okay, blot my name out, Lord. In other words, Lord, if I prosper, eh. If I fail, so what? If I take responsibility for their failure on myself, here's what you're going to find me doing up to my last breath. I'm going to be making intercession for the transgressors. Out of the anguish of his soul, he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant. He's, behold, my servant in 52.13. Now he's the righteous one. And what is the righteous one able to do? The one who stands with the Lord through all the suffering and the Lord bears him up and delivers him so that he can bear others up and deliver them, us. And that's the model that we're to follow in Christ. What will he do? By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many righteous. And he shall bear their disasters. He'll carry their disasters as the Father carries him, as he's carried their sicknesses. Therefore, I will divide him a portion with the many. And if I get a chance to teach on that some other time, Dave Pozell asked me that early last year. How do you, He was doing a study on Isaiah 53, 12. He encountered, he said, is this a legitimate translation? And I looked up all the translations in the Hebrew and found out that it's an acceptable translation. Remember the many who are astounded at him, the many nations who he's going to sprinkle? 
Well, right now, verse 11 says, my righteous servant will make the many righteous. I will divide him a portion with the many. I will divide him an inheritance with the many. I'll give him an inheritance for the many is how many translations read, but the Hebrew could read this way. I will give him the many as his portion, as his inheritance. When we suffer with Jesus, when we suffer with the church, we can impart what is lacking in the body of Christ, Colossians 1.24, and the many in the church become our inheritance. See, that's the revival I'm looking for. What kind of revival do you want, Pastor Rez? I want a revival where the Lord gives me the criminals that he sent to me, the disasters that he sent to me, the afflicted he sent to me, the oppressed he sent to me. Give them to me as an inheritance. Let them be transformed and mature and rise up in the power of the gospel as an apostolic church. That's the inheritance I want. That's Pauline inheritance. That's Moses' inheritance. He got those people to the land. He didn't lead them into the land, but he prepared them to take the land. That's the inheritance I want, and that's the inheritance that Jesus got. And look how it closes. I'll give him the many as his inheritance, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong. And what kind of spoil will it be? He's going to crush the enemies. He's going to destroy those abortionists and destroy those homosexuals and destroy those Muslims. No, he's going to lead the abortionists and the homosexuals and the LBGTQ and the Muslims up to the mountain of the Lord, like Isaiah chapter 2 says, and they're going to worship the Lord because of the impartation of an apostolic wisdom. I close, and I took way too long, but eh, we'll do it anyways. And how does he get this inheritance? Because he poured out his soul unto death. We pick up the cross and follow after Jesus. Because he poured out his soul to death, he was numbered with the criminals, he carried, he he carried in his own person the sins of the many, and he made intercession for the criminals, for the transgressors. What's the whole point of Isaiah 53? Intercessory, Christological prayer birthed out of suffering imparts an inheritance to people and makes them into our inheritance. Isaiah 53, Moses was an intercessor and he imparted everything Israel needed to take the land. Jesus is our ultimate heavenly intercessor. Hebrews 7.25, he lives to make intercession for us and Jesus has accomplished everything for us for salvation, for healing, for maturity, for accomplishing the purposes of the Lord. And what's Paul's purpose in Colossians 1? intercessory prayer in the midst of suffering for impartation for the church to get wisdom and to grow into maturity, to see Christ, to see the gospel, to see unity. Father, it was a little messy. I wasn't as orderly as it was in my mind and how I'd like to carry it out and all that, but hopefully you made your point, Lord. Make your point to your people. Leaders at Lord of the Harvest, this word is for you. Walk in thanksgiving. Seek his face. Proclaim the truth, the whole truth, not the five points that agree with your tradition, but the 15 points, the 20 points that make up the full gospel. Third, intercede. Fourth, suffer be willing to suffer for the criminals. Be willing to take other people's disasters on. Pay the debt, and you, you'll pay the debt on your knees while you're suffering. Instead of lashing out at people, being angry at people, what you will do is you will make intercession for the criminals. Grant it unto us, Father. In Jesus' name we pray it. Amen. God bless you, church. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord.